Uh, right now, the PPT is not actually mixed. Right, right. It's okay. Yes, yes. So that I understand how to do this. Right. You can. Maybe. I need to press this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In case if you need to show anything, you can. This one. Yes. Yeah. So you Perfect. Can directly. Perfect. This works well. Thank you. That's what. That's. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Oh. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hello? Yeah, is that better? Check, 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 check. It oh, should be that loud, I see. Okay. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed dean, distinguished members of the faculty, and my dear students, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture of the eminent speaker lecture series, organized by the Office of Global Engagement at IIT Madras. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our honored guest and today's speaker, Professor Carl Hendrik Helden. We're incredibly fortunate to have him join us today and share his invaluable insights and expertise. I look forward to your talk, Professor, and the interaction afterwards. Now, to begin today's proceedings, I'd like to invite Professor Mahesh Panchangula, the Dean of Alumni and Corporate Affairs, to welcome the gathering. Good evening, and uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's talk by Professor Carl Hendrik Heldon. Um, we are delighted to have you, sir, at IIT Madras, and I hope it's been a wonderful uh, short day, a few days now, and we look forward to the rest of your visit here as well. Uh, it's uh, this lecture series that the Office of Global Engagement hosts uh, is new. But the idea is, is not new to IIT Madras. We've had several eminent speakers who have come here and talked to our students and faculty over the last 60 plus years. We are, uh, what we want to do with this lecture series is create a structure, a form, a form around a whole uh, sequence of such talks that would provide a way by which students and faculty can, can sort of expect a certain formatted, if you will, um, a structured interaction with some of the best minds of the world. IIT Madras today uh, is a very research intensive university, as I was mentioning to you, with about four and a half PhD students per faculty member and roughly about almost $200 million of funding flowing through for research alone. This is a very busy beehive. Uh, our Department of Biotechnology is leading it from leading the whole pack from the front. They are very active in research in many ways, and uh, an opportunity like this is exactly what the, what the doctor ordered, I think, for what we need to catalyze thinking in a very different level. When I look at uh, research done at some of the best universities and today's research at IIT Madras, I see many similarities, but I also see some very important differences. I think opportunities like this to listen to people like Professor Heldon should be looked at as ways to think of grander and more challenging research problems. That's the part that I see, uh, that's the axis on which I see our institution broadly needing to grow a little more. I think uh, we, with your 
guidance, advice, and with your uh, with your uh, drive as an example, I think we will learn how uh, grander thinking and more um, pursuing more ambitious research uh, looks and works. Welcome again to everybody. Thank you for letting me share a few words, and we look forward to this evening's talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mahesh, for that welcome. Uh, it's great to hear that we'll be seeing many such events in the future. Next, it's my honor and great delight to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Carl Hendrik Helden. Professor Helden is from the Department of Medical Biochemistry and Microbiology at Uppsala University in Sweden, and a form former director of the Uppsala branch of Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research. Professor Helden is a world-renowned authority in molecular cell biology and cancer research. His work was instrumental in elucidating the signaling pathways regulating cell proliferation, migration, and survival, and how these pathways are perturbed in cancer cells. In particular, he has focused on unraveling the role of platelet-derived growth factor and transforming growth factor beta, or TGF beta, in cell proliferation and investigating their therapeutic potential in the fight against cancer. He's published over 440 research articles and 210 reviews, which have been cited over 71,000 times. This gives you a measure of his impact on the scientific community. Given the wide impact of his research, it is, he has been a recipient of many prestigious awards and honors, including the Pescolar American Association for Cancer Research Award and the Anders Yare Medical Prize. Being an authority in scientific research, he has served on the scientific advisory boards for several companies and academic institutions, including the German Cancer Center, Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry, European Institute for Oncology, and the European Molecular Biology Laboratories. Given his pedigree, it is not surprising that he is chairing the board of the Nobel Foundation that is tasked with identifying scientific discoveries that are of great benefit to humankind. Please join me in welcoming Professor Heldon to the stage. Then they come. Let me start by uh, expressing my si sincere thanks for the invitation to come here to IIT uh, Madras in Chennai, and uh, also for the kind introductions that you just listened to. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I have been shown some of Chennai and uh, the many places here that are worthwhile to visit, and uh, I have uh, had a great time the last two days and today I have learned a lot about the activities that goes on here at IIT, and which I found very impressive. So I have certainly enjoyed the visit here uh, enormously. And I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow when we, I will learn much more, I'm sure. So as was said, I am a cancer researcher. And the interest in my lab is um, to elucidate the mechanism for signal transduction that uh, regulates cell proliferation, survival, prolif uh, mi migration, as well as uh, differentiation. Because it turns out that the uh, perturbations of such pathways are the involved in the progression of cancer. And if we can learn uh, which these signaling pathways are and how they are controlled, we might understand how cancer develops and also possibly how we should treat cancer. So this is our aim. And today I will focus on our work on TGF beta. Of course. Is that, is it working? Can you hear me? Very good. So I will focus today then on our work on TGF beta and discuss in particular how targeting of TGF beta signaling 
might be uh, helpful in tumor treatment. So the TGF beta superfamily is a family of cytokines containing more than 30 related dimeric factors. And they are, sorry, they are uh, divided in subfamilies, the TGF betas, active in inhibins, bone morphogenetic proteins, and growth and differentiation factors. And they all act via formation of heterotetrameric receptor complexes of type 1 and type 2 serin 3 and in kinase receptors. And they all have important roles during the embryonal development. And when we look at the cellular level, their effects are most often growth inhibition, although there are examples of growth stimulation. They, many of them promote matrix production and cell differentiation, and some of them induce apoptosis. So TGF-beta itself is made as a precursor. Uh, and during the secretion of this factor, it is cleaved into, uh, to liberate the uh, uh, active molecule, the growth factor, which is red here, and the precursor. But the active molecule occurs in a complex with it, its own precursor, which in, and in this form, TGF-beta is inactive. And often this complex are also containing other molecules like the LTBP and the GART molecules that are present particularly in immune cells, which makes it uh, uh, adhere to extracellular matrix and the cell surface of specific proteins. In order then for TGF-beta to act on its receptors, it needs to be activated. That, that is released from this large latent complex. And then when it has done so, it brings together the receptors in the complex and induces signaling. So this is a uh, structural view on TGF-beta, which is bound to its receptors. This is a, a view from up, up from, from above. And here is the type 2 receptor, the type 1 receptor, and here is TGF-beta, which is an anti-parallel dimeric structure looking a little bit like two hands that are, are, are looking like this. And this is a side view of the whole thing. And this is a composition in which the extracellular complex is, passes to cell membrane and then brings together the kinase domains uh, shown here so that the type 2 kinase domain can phosphorylate the type 1 receptor uh, and then thereby activate the type 1 receptor kinase, which is then mainly responsible for, future, for the further signaling. So the big family of TGF-beta-like molecules contain, and as I said, TGF-beta active in growth and differentiation factors and bone morphogenetic proteins. And there are actually seven different type 1 receptors and five different type 2 receptors that these factors bind to. Whereas the BMPs often bind to more than one receptor in a rather promiscuous manner, TGF-beta is more specific. It has one type 2 receptor and two type 1 receptors. There's one being then this receptor called type 1 receptor, TGF-beta or ALK5, and another one which is called ALK1. <coughs> ALK but this is present only on endothelial cells. So this is the receptor which conveys most of the signaling in almost all cell types in the body. <coughs> and TGF-beta has an important function during the embryonal development, as I said, but also in tissue homeostasis, and it acts on endothelial cells, for instance, controlling their migration and the morphogenesis and the growth. They inhibit the growth of endothelial cells, and they have important functions on the immune cells, which I will return to. It inhibits T cells, for instance, and also other immune cells. It acts on the epithelium, also inhibiting the growth of this epithelium, sometimes inducing apoptosis, it affects the addition and matrix production, which is important as well, and cytokine production. And it also acts on fibroblasts and promotes extracellular matrix production in those fibroblasts and also affects their proliferation and cytokine secretion. So this is a clearly a multifunctional molecule which is involved in many different contexts. So the signaling occurs then by the TGF-beta molecule binding to its receptors and then inducing intracellular signals. The most well-characterized and sort of the private signaling pathway to TGF-beta is activation of SMAD molecules. So TGF-beta phosphorylates SMAD 2 or 3 in their C-termini, and that makes them form complexes with SMAD 4 <coughs> that moves into the nucleus and affects the uh, transcription of specific genes. 
So this is essentially transcription factors that are activated at the receptor level and then moves into the nucleus. But TGF-beta also has a number of non-SMAD signaling pathways. For instance, the MAP kinase pathways, ERK, JUNK, and P38, as well as uh, SARC, which is a tyrosine kinase, and also PAR6 leading to, act, uh, to effects on raw signaling that is involved then in, in regulation of tight junctions. So after TGF-beta has bound to its receptor, it is internalized in complex with its receptor. And this can occur either by clattering coated pits, in which leads to activation of SARCs, with, uh, so activation of SMAD molecules, which are presented by the adapter molecule SARA, and then the, the uh, activation goes on for some time at early endosomes, and then there is two choices. Either the um, receptor can be recycled and used again, or it can be degraded. So most of the receptors are, are actually recycled and then can work again. But then there is a second uh, internalization route, and that goes via kyvalin positive lipid rafts. And in the, if the receptor is internalized here, it meets uh, degradation machinery and is then uh, targeted for degradation in proteasomes or lysosomes. So what about then the TGF-beta family members in cancer, which is really our major interest? Well, initially, it is a tumor suppressor because it inhibits the growth of cells and it induces apoptosis. But at later stages, it often becomes a tumor promoter because the effects uh, involving effects on tumor cells including, for instance, epithelial mesenchymal transition, <clears throat> which is a change in morphology of epithelial cancers, making them more mesenchymal. And in this context, they become more invasive and more prone to form metastasis. But it also effect, involves effects of other cell types. For instance, TGF-beta suppresses the immune system, and it stimulates angiogenesis, and it stimulates cancer-associated fibroblasts, all of which is tumor-promoting. <clears throat> So why would it be of interest then to explore TGF-beta inhibitors for the treatment of advanced cancer? Well, TGF-beta is expressed at high levels in most solid tumors, <clears throat> and it studies on animal models support the notion that TGF-beta drives the development of advanced cancer. And TGF-beta has tumor-promoting effects both on cancer cells and on normal cells, as I just told you. And TGF-beta promotes metastasis, which is the cause of deaths of more than 90% of cancer patients. But there are challenges if we want to develop TGF-beta antagonists to treat tumor patients, because complete inhibition of TGF-beta may promote tumor formation, since TGF-beta has important tumor suppressive effects on several tumor types. And secondly, TGF-beta receptor kinase inhibitors have adverse effects on heart function. So as you probably know, many of the tyrosine kinases and other kinases uh, are driving tumor genesis, so make Many pharmaceutical companies make inhibitors for these kinases, and that includes the TGF-beta type 1 and 2 receptors. Unfortunately, these inhibitors that have been used have shown side effects on heart, which makes them difficult to use clinically. So we need to be selective. Otherwise, it will be difficult to use TGF-beta antagonists clinically. And one can think of different kinds of selectivity. For instance, one can use, develop selective inhibitors of pro signaling pathways in tumor cells, leaving the tumor suppressive pathways unperturbed. Or one can uh, selectively inhibit individual TGF-beta isoforms. There are three of them, beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. Beta-1 is the one which is most often overexpressed in cancers, and TGF-beta-3 are sometimes expressed. But TGF-beta-2 is never overexpressed in tumors, so possibly one can inhibit one or two out of these three and then escape these uh, side effects or the possibilities of uh, suppressing the tumor suppressive activity, which one would not do. And the third is to inhibit TGF-beta signaling only locally, for instance, to relieve immune suppression, because I as I will return to TGF-beta suppresses the immune system, which is of uh, importance in tumor development. And if one can selectively in the immune system inhibit TGF-beta, that would help. <coughs> we have focused on the first possibility here, and this is what I will describe today. So this is a very simplified cartoon of TGF-beta signaling. 
the TGF-beta first binds to the type 2 receptor, and then the type 1 receptor is recruited into the complex and mediates signaling them, either via SMAD2, SMAD4 complexes, which is important during cell differentiation, during embryonal development, and in growth arrest. And SMAD3, SMAD4 complexes are involved in formation of EMP. And then we have the junk MP38, MAP kinase pathways, which are involved in apoptosis and also migration of cells. And then the ERK MAP kinase pathway, as well as transcription factors of the AP1 family, the phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase pathway, the tyrosine kinase SARC, and also cleavage of the receptor to form an intracellular fragment which moves into the nucleus. They all uh, affect, they stimulate growth and they stimulate survival and migration and invasion. So all the red signals here are proteomerianic, they we want to, to suppress, but the green one we want to retain. So in order to do that, we need to learn the mechanisms involved in activation of these pathways. And it, with regard to SMADs, they, quite a lot is known, but with regard to the non-SMAD pathways, we know much less. So this is where we have put our major effort. So stress that this is an oversimplification. And in many cases, this duality of TGF-beta receptor can be also uh, explained on the molecular level. So for instance, SMAD signaling, which often induces growth inhibition and apoptosis, if combined with a certain type of transcription factor, can also, together with other transcription factors, induce invasion and metastasis. And to give you one example, we used RNA, uh, sorry, chromatin immunoprecipitation, uh, followed by DNA, DNA sequencing of whatever bound them to SMAD2 and 3 in this context. After one and a half hour TGP-beta stimulation, we found a little bit, more, little bit more than 2,200 genes that were affected. After 16 <coughs> hours of TGF-beta treatment, we found even more. And interestingly, there was a large, large difference in the programs that were in, in, induced early and late after TGF-beta stimulation. And looking further on the programs that were activated in the short term, of course, TGF-beta signaling pathways were, were dramatically uh, emphasized, which is obvious. But at later stages, other pathways like focal additions and MAP kinase sing signaling came up, and matrix receptor interactions, and, and many other signalings. So we then looked further onto this and saw that in the genes to which SMADs bind and that are regulated then by TGF-beta, there was often a consensus sequence close to this consensus for SMAD binding, which is a consensus for AP1 family member binding. And we then looked at the AP1 family member, some of their members, like the JUN and JUN B are induced by TGF-beta, as is shown here on this immunoblot. Uh, other members are not, like JUN D FOS is induced and FOS B as well, but not FOS1 and, and to some extent FOS2. So we decided to focus on JUN B and could show that <clears throat> JUN B is important for induction of activation of serpin 1, which encodes PI1 and LAMP3, because if one uh, knocks down JUN B, you see that in this chromatin immunoprecipitation assay, there is much less binding of SMADs to th this gene. And this is true also for LAMP3, whereas another gene, MMP2, is not touched. And likewise, the induction of, TGP, the induction of mRNA for serpin 1 which happens after uh, six hours of stimulation or 16 hours of stimulation, is suppressed if you knock down uh, John B. And the same is true for LAMP3, but there is no effect on MMP2. So to summarize these findings, SMAD induce certain genes, some involved in cytostasis uh, growth suppression. Others are then uh, induced like John B and act together with SMAD molecules in order to uh, stimulate migration of cells, for instance, which is a proteomerianic effect. So TGF-beta activates not only SMAD molecules, but also non-SMAD molecules, which I have mentioned. <clears throat> so this involves then ERK-MAP kinase pathways, uh, PI3 kinase are ACT and mTORC, as well as uh, uh, other MAP kinase pathways, JUNK and P38. And I'll tell you a little bit about our work to try to understand how TGF-beta activates these non-SMAD pathways, because they are particularly involved in the tumorigenic signaling of TGF-beta. 
So we saw that in the uh, TGF beta type binding receptor or ALK sequence, there is a consensus sequence for binding of uh, the ubiquitin ligase trap 6. As you can see here, this is a consensus motif and it is found here in ALK5. So we then investigated whether uh, trap 6 binds to the receptor and it does. And not only that, it, it binds here and then activates the MAP kinase 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 TAC1, which in turn activates the MAP kinase kinase 3 or 6, which activates then P38, which is the MAP kinase. And also junk, which is not shown here on this uh, slide. Uh, this induces apoptosis and migration. And interestingly, this pathway is induced whether the, regardless of whether the kinase is active or not because the real uh, effector here is TRAP6, which somehow is activated in this uh, uh, complex, presumably by ubiquitination of one molecule to the other. But that is not really clear. Should emphasize also that ubiquitination often marks proteins for degradation in proteasomes or lysosomes. But this particular modification is on lysine 63, and that uh, sometimes do not linked to degradation, but rather to activation of molecules, which is what we see here. So we have now to take into consideration the kinase-dependent activation of SMAD molecules, which uh, is sort of the, the, the co conventional TGF-beta signaling pathway, but in addition, a ubiquitin-dependent activation of TAC1 and, in the end, P38 and junk. So the question is then, is TRAP6 involved in other signaling pathways? And the answer is yes. And I'll give you a few examples. So if we stain for the receptor after six hours of TGF-beta stimulation, we can see that if we use an antibody against the intracellular part, called V22, we see a nuclear accumulation of the receptor very clearly. However, if we use an antibody against the extracellular part of the molecule, we see a clustering of it, but not in the nucleus. It is still elsewhere in the cell. So this suggests that the receptor is cleaved and the intracellular part moves into the nucleus. Uh, we explored this further and could show then that the cleavage occurs and we can see in this immunoblot staining for the receptor full length is up here. And after TGF-beta stimulation for half an hour, we can see the formation here of the intracellular fragment of 34,000 molecular weight. Interestingly, if we now use the TRAP6 negative mutant receptor that cannot bind TRAP6, there is no formation of the intracellular domain. And this ubiquitination of the intracellular domain and the receptor that is seen in the normal case is also lost. And the activation of P38 that we can see here on this immunoblot using a phosphospecific antibody for P38 is also gone. So this tells us that TRAP6 is involved here in the uh, uh, liberation of the uh, uh, intracellular domain of the type 1 receptor. So what does then the type, one, the type intracellular domain do in the nucleus? Well, it associates with the, the co-activated P300, which is shown here. This is um, uh, in this co-immunoprecipitation experiment in which we have used antibodies to immunoprecipitate the, the receptor and then and other antibodies to recognize P300 on the gel. And as you can see, TGF-beta induces an interaction between these molecules. And it furthermore induces uh, some uh, genes, including SNAIL-1, which is a transcription factor involved in migration, MMP2, which is a protease, which is also involved in migration of cells. And in conclusion, TGF-beta induces a number of genes that are involved in an inv invasiveness program via liberation of its intracellular domain. So we could show also that the TGF-beta-induced migration in this assay cells are migrating through a collagen gel and out through a filter. And this is what you can see on the other side of the filter after staining. So TGF-beta stimulation for 24 hours leads to a rather efficient migration of these prostate cancer cells. But if we, instead of the wild-type type 1 receptor, as a mutant type 1 receptor, which cannot be cleaved, we have changed the cleavage site, then there is no TGF-beta induced migration. Interestingly, we see this nuclear translocation of the intracellular domain only in 
uh, cancer cells, like the PC3U cells as shown here, and not the normal uh, uh, prostate epithelial cells as is illustrated here. We don't really know why there is a tumor specificity here, but it may be linked to the expression of proteases by the, uh, cancer cells versus normal cells. <clears throat> so, TRAP6 then mediates the activation of uh, P38 and junk, as I have told you, and the liberation of the intracellular domain. But there are other signaling pathways which also are linked to invasion. Tyrosine kinase SARC and phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase. So we have done an elucidative mechanism by which these are activated. And to start with PI3 kinase, this molecule, it's, it's a family of enzymes consisting of um, a regulatory P85 subunit and a catalytic 110 subunit. And they act then on PI45 bisphosphate to make PI345 trisphosphate. And this is a crucial mediator of signaling. And it activates, uh, for instance, the serine threonine kinase act, which in turn activates a number of different signaling molecules leading to a number of effects inside the cell, including cell migration. <coughs> so how is then PI3 kinase activated by the TGF, the TGF beta stimulation? Well, you can see here that the TGF beta induce, induces ubiquitination of P85, the regular subunit of uh, PI. I3 kinase. And uh, this is, a, again, a, a co-IP experiment in which we have used an antibody against P85 to immunoprecipitate P85, and then an antibody against u ubiquitin to blot the, with afterwards. However, if we knock down TRAF6, there is no uh, ubiquitination of P85, telling us that it is TRAF6 that ubiquitinates P85. So is this of any importance? Well, we localized the ubiquitination sites in uh, P85 to lysine 513 and lysine 519. And if we mutate one or the other or both, we can see that the TGF beta induced formation of PIP3, PI3, uh, trisphosphate, which is the, sub, the product of this enzyme. It's lost if we mutate one and even worse if we mutate, mutate both of these lysine residues. And in parallel, then, activation of, P, of ACT measured here as with a phosphospecific antibody against serine 473. And another site that is also important for activation is threonine 308. You see that the TGF beta induced activation is lost if you mutate both these uh, lysine residues that are ubiquitinated. And is this of any importance for tumors? We looked on, on material from prostate cancer patients, and we subjected them to staining. As you can see here, more benign uh, prostate cancers versus more malignant one. There is more staining of SMAD2 in the more malignant ones. And there is more staining also for phosphorylated AKT, as you can see comparing these two. Then we looked on whether the activation of AKT was due to TGF-beta-induced uh, PI3 kinase activation. And to do that, we used proximity ligation assay, using one antibody against P85 and another against ubiquitin. And as you can see here, small dots that represent um, uh, that these two antibodies come close to, to, to each other are much more prevalent here in the more malignant prostate cancer compared to the more benign ones. So the conclusion is that TGF-beta induced PI3 kinase activity occurs in, in prostate cancer cells and could contribute to their invasiveness. So this is a summary of what I just said. So after TGF-beta has assembled the heterotetrameric receptor complex, TRAF is involved here, and TRAF then uh, recruits the regulatory P85 subunit and phosphorylates uh, ubiquitinates it uh, on two lysine residues. And then that, that activates the catalytic P110 subunit, which then phosphorylates and activates AKT, and, and then causes further signaling inside. So what about SARC? Well, SARC is also an important intracellular mediator, which is activated by tyrosine kinase receptors, like EGF and other tyrosine kinase receptors, and integrins via then FAK. 
Uh, SARC in turn activates a number of pathways intracellular that leads to proliferation and the cytoskeletal reorganization and so forth. And the mechanism then by which TG beta activates SARC was of interest for us. So we could show that TG beta do activate SARC in the kinase independent manner, shown here using a phosphospecific antibody against SARC, which monitors activation of SARC. You see that TG beta after 15 and 30 minutes clearly activates SARC. <clears throat> if you put in an inhibitor for the uh, kinase activity of the re receptor, it doesn't matter, it still activates. And th this is true for one cell, and this is true for uh, another type of cell as well. In this case, we also could uh, show that the tgf beta stimulation induces a complex between the type 1 receptor and SARC in this co-immunoprecipitation experiment. If we use an antibody to immunoprecipitate the receptor, V22, you see that in the absence of tg beta stimulation, there is a faint band here uh, representing uh, co-immunoprecipitation. But if we stimulate with tg beta, this band is more pronounced, telling us that tg beta stimulation induces a complex with SARC. And we could also show that SARC also binds to the type 2 receptor in this co-immunoprecipitation assay. And, and here, it doesn't matter whether we stimulate with TGF beta or not. In the absence of stimulation, there is also a co-immune precipitation. And in the presence of TGF beta stimulation, likewise. So this tells us that <clears throat> there is a constitutive complex between the type 2 receptor and SARC. And we can also show then that the type 2 receptor kinase activity, unlike the type 1 receptor kinase activity, is needed for SARC activation. Because in this experiment, if we now uh, stimulate cells with TGF beta, we can see that there is a slight activation of SARC with this phosphospecific antibody. And if we transfect wild type SARC, uh, sorry, wild type, type 2 receptor, there is enhanced stimulation of this SARC molecule. But if we transfect a kinase dead uh, uh, type 2 receptor, we see that there is a loss of phosphorylation of SARC, telling us that the kinase activity of type 2 receptor is needed. We could then show that the type 2 receptor phosphorylates the type 1 receptor on a specific tyrosine residue, 182, because if we mutate this particular residue, we, saw, we see no uh, co precipitation be, uh, between, sorry, we see no phosphorylation of the receptor uh, using a phosphotyrosine antibody of the immunoprecipitated receptor, which is seen for the wild-type receptor as well as for uh, another tyrosine mutation of the receptor. We could also see that after SARC has been activated, it phosphorylates the receptor itself on several tyrosine residues, as is shown here in, in an in vitro kinase assay. TGF beta type 1 receptor phosphorylates the, uh, uh, sorry, SARC phosphorylates the type 1 receptor and if you mutate uh, several of the kind of tyrosine residues, it doesn't really hap much happen unless you phosphorylate 11 of them, then you lose the phosphorylation. We can, this, unfortunately, this 11 tyrosine mutant has lost also the kinase activity, so it's not so much useful. But if we mutate instead eight, we can also deprive itself of most of the phosphorylation of tyrosine residues. So, we could then show also that the SARC family members is necessary for TGF beta induced tyrosine phosphorylation of type 1 receptor because if we, in this experiment, use now uh, immunoprecipitation of the receptor and the blotting for phosphotyrosine, we see that TGF beta induces phosphorylation of uh, its own receptor on tyrosine residues, but not only in the presence of uh, SARC, not in cells that are deprived of SARC and the Cassins of SARC, yes, and FIN, then there is no phosphorylation of the receptor on tyrosine residues. So what is then the function of SARC in TGF beta signaling? Well, in this cartoon, we can see that fibronectin is induced by TGF beta, which is well known. If you put in the SARC inhibitor, this is completely lost, as well as it is if we put in a type 1 receptor inhibitor. So this means that SARC is needed for TGF beta induction of fibronectin, but not in, in the induction of another molecule that is also induced by TGF-beta, which is PI-1. 
We could also show that TGF beta induces migration. We focus here on the red bars because the, to make it easier. So TGF beta closes the wound of um, um, breast cancer cells if stimulated for, 20, for 48 hours. Uh, and if one now put in the, the inhibitor of the uh, TGF beta type 1 receptor, that it's sort of loss of this effect. And an inhibitor of SARC also gives less TGF beta induced migration compared to this with this one. And we can also show that in this mouse embryo fibroblasts that lack uh, the uh, SARC molecule, there is also less TGF beta induced migration. And if we retransfect SARC into these cells, we can see that we can induce a more efficient uh, migration by TGF beta. So this is the cartoon which shows us the mechanism whereby TGF beta activates SARC. So before TGF beta stimulation, SARC ha shows, occurs in a complex with the type 2 receptor. SARC consists of the kinase domain as well as an SH2 domain and an SH3 domain. And the SH2 domain is SARC it binds to a phosphorylated tyrosine in its own tail when SARC is inactive. However, after TGF beta stimulation, uh, SARC is then, <coughs> uh, the SA2 domain of SARC is then binding instead to the phosphorylated tyrosine in the type 1 receptor by the type 2 receptor. And this opens up SARC and activates it. And SARC then becomes capable of phosphorylating the type 1 receptor on several tyrosine residues. So this is the model we want to propose. And this is a summary of the pathways that I have described. So amongst the non-SMAD signaling pathways that promotes invasion, a TAC1 is involved in activation of P38 and the young MAP kinase pathway, as well as a, a, a PI3 kinase and in the liberation of the intracellular domain. So this joins forces in a, promoting invasion. SARC, in contrast, is not dependent on TRAP6, but involves, is activated by another mechanism also contributing to invasion, as is ERK, which I haven't talked about. So a few words about epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which <coughs> is a proteomerianic effect induced by TGF beta. So this shows what it is all about. Ecaderin is the marker for epithelial cells. And upon TGF beta stimulation, you see that this cuboidal path um, pattern is lost. And the, uh, there is less uh, ecaderin. And what remains is completely different in terms of cell localization. If one stains for actin, you see also the cuboidal pattern, which is changed into more elongated cells looking like fibroblasts. And TGF beta stimulates this quite dramatically. So EMT is a, a, a sort of a natural process which uh, occurs both during the development and in wound healing, as well as in, in cancer invasion. And it undergoes several stages. So the, there is a loss of cells cell contacts, and then there is a gain of mesenchymal pro, uh, proteins, and then cells lose grip of each other and become more invasive. So in the context of cancer, a few cells in the primary cancer undergo this EMT. These are the red ones here. And then they uh, become more mesenchymal, as is shown here. And then they migrate through the tissue and into blood vessels. And at another site, they extravasate, and again, form uh, metastasis start to grow again. But then they revert back to more epithelial cells. So this involvement of EMT in metastasis has made us uh, ask the question whether inhibition of EMT would be advantageous to prevent metastasis. So we have therefore looked into ways of inhibiting TGF beta induced EMT. Uh, and try to learn a little bit about the mechanisms involved. We know that SMADs are involved as a number of different uh, transcription factors. They are difficult to drag. So what we did was to make an unbiased uh, screen using uh, a chemical library in collaboration with Martino Serial. Uh, and this assay was then used in order to try to block EMT induced by TGF beta. And the assay is displayed here. So this is a staining for E. cadherin, which is epithelial cell stain. And this is in green staining for uh, fibronectin. And after 72 hours of stimulation with TGF beta, there is very little red stain and very much more green stain. 
illustrating that cells have undergone EMT. Then if we now put in the uh, inhibitor of the kinase activity of the receptor, we can block uh, the um, EMT, so it's reversible. As you can see, the green color disappears and more and more of the red comes back uh, in the presence of this inhibitor, which inhibits activation of SMADs, but they are also involved in, in uh, tumor suppressor activity, so it's dangerous to use those it's mad inhibitors in order to for cancer treatment. So we then used this assay and we come, came up with a number of hits and we could, in collaboration with Andrew Xiao, uh, test 13 of these compounds. And uh, I will just show you data on two of them. We call them epithelial plasticity modifier, number 10 and number 13. As you can see here in this staining for E. cadherin, this cubital uh, pattern is completely changed, the Pontigia beta stimulation. And then if one put in this EM compound, you see that it's partially reverted, and the other compartment as well. Uh, and, and this is a control using the inhibitor for the kinase activity, which also then partially reverts EMT. So we have some lead substances here which could be potentially useful. However, they need to be developed because the affinity uh, potency of this compound is not good enough. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about uh, uh, EMT, how I can image EMT. So we developed a uh, breast cancer model for EMT imaging based on the fact that we put an RFP, which causes red color, after the e uh, molecule, uh, gene, sorry. And if one does so, the cells become red, as you can see here. If we st stain this, stimulate these cells by TGF beta, we induce this EMT. The cells lose the red color and become more mesenchymal. And then if we remove TGF beta, the EMT is reverted to mesenchymal epithelial transition, taking a week or so, and then most of the cells are red. And if we wait another three to five days, almost all cells are red again showing us that EMT is promoted by TGF beta, but reversible. If you remove TGF beta, it goes back. And this is, staining, uh, uh, this is analysis of certain of the markers. e cadherin goes down and comes back, and the uh, 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 adherin of fibronectin of bimentin goes up and comes down again, as does uh, uh, a number of transcription factors that are shown to be involved in EMT. So I think I'll skip this one. <clears throat> we then tested these cells in sphere formation. So to grow in spheres is an indication of stemless character of uh, uh, cells. And TGF beta induces EMT, and EMT in turn is related to stemness. So it, it, this is illustrated here because if these cells uh, are grown as spheres, TGF beta in, induces their proliferation, the, the size of the spheres. BMP that doesn't do much here, as you can see. These are related compounds to TGF beta. If one now stains the cells, you see that they lose the red color, which in essence means that they become more mesenchymal, and the BMPs have much less effect. If one looks in more detail on the transfer between the epithelial cells to mesenchymal cells, the presence of EPCAM is a marker for epithelial cells. And then there is a number of markers for mesenchymal cells, P51, CD51, CD61, and CD106. So by fax analysis, one of our postdocs, Tobiko Hara, could show that these cells that are not EPCAM positive, 95%, in the uh, 3D context, without TGF beta stimulation, most of them did not have any of the additional mesenchymal markers. But after stimulation with TGF beta, they did so. So a number of them had uh, an additional marker, and several had two, uh, and a few had even three, telling us they, that they have become more mesenchymal. But there is a continuum, and the most sort of uh, Invasive cells are actually not those that become completely mesenchymal, but rather those that are somewhere in between. And then we looked at the stemless character of these um, uh, TGF beta stimulated cells. And you can see here that if one grows cells in two dimensions, 
in the absence, in the presence of TGF beta, and then give them additional TGF beta or not. You see that they are not very red. We can forget about BMP, which doesn't have much effect here. And if one then monitor the stemness properties of these cells, one can see that the control is over here, and this is a dilution of cells, meaning that uh, counting how many, uh, you dilute cells from rather many to almost none, and then you see where you can detect colonies in the various cases. And the, the more, the, the steeper the curve, the more stemless character. And as you can see here, the control is over here. If we stimulate with TGF beta, we come here, and if we then uh, stimulate even more with TGF beta, both in 2Ds and 3Ds, we come over here, telling us that the cells have really become very stem cell-like and very prone to, to uh, uh, form metastasis. So this is also a finding we made that TGF beta stimulates the growth of the mammosphere, as you've seen here, but surprisingly not uh, invasion, which was a little bit of a surprise to us. So finally, I would like to conclude. TGF beta antagonists targeting tumor cells it would be desirable to inhibit TGF beta's proteomerogenic effects, EMT, invasiveness, metastasis, that I have talked about here, while leaving TGF beta's tumor suppressive effects unperturbed. And this involves growth inhibition and apoptosis. And the approaches one can think of is to inhibit the formation of the intracellular domain of TGF beta, which I have described. One can also inhibit TGF beta induced activation of PI3 kinase or SARC or MAP kinases of the P38 junk family, which I have talked about. One can also inhibit AP1 SMAD interaction, which I described. I, one can also inhibit delta NP63 interaction, which I didn't have time to talk about. Or possibly one can inhibit TGF beta induced EMT using the methods that I uh, touched upon briefly. And what will work clinically remains to be sorted out. We are still in the very early phase of these studies. So I'd like to, to um, end here by um, acknowledging the people who have been involved in, in this work. In my group, these people uh, that are mentioned here, and in particular for the, what I have told you today, and the Sundqvist, Ria Vasilaki, Oleg Wojtyk, and Ihor, and Maria Jokimovic was involved. And we have collaborated with Marianne Landström and Aris Mustakas, working uh, with us on, on the non-SMAD signaling and EMT in particular. And we have also collaborations with Kohemia Sono in Japan, Peter Tendaike in Holland, and Mitsuyasu Kato in uh, Japan as well. And those marked in green have left the laboratory and work elsewhere for the moment. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you uh, for that very interesting talk, to Dr. Heldin. So the question I have is um, this EMT transition that you spoke of, which can be triggered by just TGF beta cell. Is that the only pathway for EMT transition? In other words, if you inhibit the TGF signaling, is there an alternative rescue pathway by which uh, this transition can occur. After all, the cancer cells do compete this for is, growth with the normal cells. This is a very good question, and the, the answer is that there are also other signaling molecules that promote EMT, and in particular, uh, fact, growth factors that can activate RAS, the oncogene RAS, for instance, FGF, uh, promotes uh, uh, MT as well. And in the context of RAS activation, which is very common in tumors, the TGF beta effect is much stronger. There is a sort of collaboration between RAS signaling and TGF beta signaling, which is particularly efficient in inducing EMT. So, sorry to follow up. Uh, if you inhibit the TGF signaling, does the RAS signaling then get more activated? And also, what are the other factors which would enhance the kinetics of TGF signaling? I mean, is it 
related to the other physiological factors. So enhanced beta signaling? Yeah. Yeah, that, that is uh, brave, I would say. The beta has so many unwanted effects. So I think that would be dangerous. No, no. I'm saying uh, what are the factors which enhance uh, the transition? You showed different ah, yeah, slopes okay. of transitions. Yeah. Right? So That's an important question, of course. TGF beta is overexpressed in cancers, and the question is, what is the mechanism behind behind the overexpression of TGF beta in cancers? I don't. That is not so well studied, and the, it's not known exactly what is the mechanism that induces TGF beta. But it is seen that several of the other cytokines and growth factors can do that. So it's possible that in the milieu in the solid tumor, where a lot of this, chemokines and cytokines and growth factors are produced by cancer-associated fibroblasts and immune cells and cancer cells themselves, that that can contribute to the increased amount of TGF beta seen. And the TGF beta in tumors can be made both by the tumor cells and by the stromal cells. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Call. This is Karthik here. So uh, TGF, does it have a concentration-dependent effect, like the TGF beta? Uh, the cytokines usually have a concentration-dependent effect. Can, can, can you speak louder, please? Uh, cytokines usually have a concentration-dependent effect, right? So the TGF beta, does it have the signaling pathway that TGF beta chooses? Is it concentration-dependent? Sorry, I, I, I cannot okay. hear the question. So the TGF beta, uh, the cytokines are usually concentration-dependent, right? So the TGF, the pathway that TGF beta chooses, is it concentration dependent? Um, if I want, if you want yes, me yes. to rephrase yeah. it, what he wants to know is whether TGF beta activity or it's uh, is concentration dependent. Certain concentration it chooses, certain downstream effect. Certain concentration it chooses, different downstream effect. Oh, yeah. uh, TGF beta is a very potent molecule. It acts at sub nanomolar, uh, sub nanogram per ml concentrations and give quite a robust response for epithelial cells. It, there is a need for a little bit higher concentrations to act on fibroblasts. Where the different concentrations, uh, in addition, induces different signals, it's le less well studied. And uh, I don't think there is any solid evidence that that can happen, whereas there is a lot of speculations. Thanks. So, so follow-up question is that, so in a fibrosis environment, we have a higher TGF beta microenvironment compared to a normal state. So how does the signaling differs on both the sides? Yeah. So in a fibrotic environment compared to normal normal environment, we'll have higher TGF beta. How does that affect the signaling? Yeah, yes. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. It is true that TGF beta induces fibrosis very efficiently because of its induction of extracellular matrix molecules. It is also true that in this uh, sort of extracellular matrix, the stiffer it is, the more collagen bundles it has, the more TGF beta will be activated because it is activated in an integrin dependent manner and integrin then sort of uh, acts through this uh, collagen pathway, uh, collagen fibrils. And, um, uh, I also stress that TGF beta, as I told you, is made as a latent inactive precursor, and it needs to be activated before it, there is any effect on cells. And there is quite a lot of TGF beta laying around in our tissues that are inactive. So if one wants TGF beta activity, uh, the fastest way is to activate what is already there out in the tissues. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was a great overview of TGF beta activity. So I have two questions, if, I'm, if the time permits. Uh, first one is your initial, uh, when you expose TGF beta for short time, longer time, you had a different uh, signaling pathway altogether when you expose longer, isn't it? So that is intrigue. I was kind of intrigued by that because you know how TGF beta can be uh, pro death in the beginning and then more pro tumorigenic later. So, does that depend on kind of a constant exposure to TGF beta, or can you have a cellular system where it didn't see TGF beta at all, 
But then at the later stage, when you expose to TGF beta, it is still being pro tumorigenic. Or does it need TGF beta to be <coughs> present from the beginning? Well, I think the answer is that initially TGF beta induces a number of genes, including several transcription factors, mm -hmm. which in turn activate other genes. And that gives rise to the very different pattern of signaling pathways that are activated at the later stage. But in the tissue, we have to think of this as a continuous process where TGF beta is around all the time. And that would then sort of probably lead to that we'll, we will get this effect that we see after prolonged activation in, in vitro. And uh, that will also be what is mediating the effects of TGF beta, tumor suppressor or tum tumor promoter. Yeah. So with your uh, work on SRC and other PA3 kinase, um, where you show that TGF beta, for example, SRC is required for TGF beta activation. So, can we use SARC as a prognostic marker, for example, to treat these patients with the TGF beta inhibitor? That is certainly a possibility. I should say that SARC, as you all know, is one of the, is the first um, discovered oncogenes and received the Nobel Prize in 1989, uh, going to. Uh, Barmus and Bishop, and um, SARC is certainly involved in many tumorigenic contexts and uh, activated not only by TGF beta but by tyrosine kinase receptors as well. And it could certainly be a, a, a marker if you found a good reagent to monitor phosphorylation of SARC specifically, which is theoretically possible with the phosphospecific antibodies available, but. In, in practice, it might be challenging. Thank you, Carl, for highlighting the latest developments on TGF beta signaling. Um, in your uh, slides, I saw that PA3 kinase activation, you are calling it as non SMAD, right? But in prostate cancers, I see phospho SMAD2. How to understand that it is non SMAD? Well, TGF beta induces both SMAD signaling Correct. and non SMAD signaling. So, if you, we want to monitor TGF beta signaling, we can monitor both. And that will give us an indication whether the TGF beta is active or not, uh, as was the case in the prostate cancer cells. So, in the more advanced cancers, yes, there is more uh, SMAD uh, activation than in the more benign ones. Okay, so if we prevent that smart phosphorylation, do you still see PA3 kinase activation? Yes, yeah, we would, because if we inhibit the kinase activity of the type 1 receptor, we will completely lose SMAD phosphorylation, SMAD activation, but we will still retain PA3 kinase activation. Okay, okay. That, uh, only then we may be, uh, uh, we can ascertain that it is non SMAD. Uh, pathway, right? Yes, but I think your point is well taken because it's often so, which I gave an example of, that SMADs collaborate with non-SMAD signaling. So it's not so separated, it, it's sort of crosstalk. Uh, hi, Carl. Uh, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, my question was, uh, when the TGA beta is being secreted, uh, can you give some perspective on how it auto-stimulates the cell towards a proliferative program? And if there is some kind of positive feedback that keeps going on, and uh, is there a way to break that positive feedback loop? So, repeat the first part of the question. When TGA beta is being secreted by the cells. TGA beta is secreted? Right. Yeah. Uh, can it auto-stimulate the cells yes. towards a positive feedback loop? Yeah. And is there a strategy to break that loop? No, this, this is quite possible. The autocrine stimulation has been described both for TGF beta and for other growth factors, PGGF, that we have worked on ourselves. So that's certainly a possibility. Uh, in the case of PGGF, that is a tumor type called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance in which uh, the TGF, PDGF B chain gene has been hooked up to, fused with the collagen gene. That, and this, this cells make enormous amount of this fusion protein. And then the growth factor part is cleaved off and act 
in a truly autocrine fashion, driving tumorigenesis of this particular tumor. And the similar situation do prevail for TGF beta. Autocrine stimulation certainly occurs. Uh, one more question. Uh, when you are applying all these EMT antagonists, uh, you are uh, creating cells with uh, different kinds of hybrid states, which are neither fully epithelial nor fully mesenchymal. And as you said, some of them have higher invasive potential than a fully mesenchymal state cells. So in terms of clinical therapy, when we are applying all these antagonists, are you not increasing the intratumoral heterogeneity of your population? And <coughs> yes. what is your idea? No, you're right. When we started this uh, project, EMT was sort of thought of making epithelial cells more mesenchymal, and the more mesenchymal ones would be more invasive. So blocking that transition could potentially prevent metastasis. Now we have learned that it is more complicated because it's not the fully mesenchymal cells that are the most invasive. It's those that are in between, partially EMT. And then, of course, it becomes more tricky to sort of find an appropriate way of, of using TGF-beta inhibitors in order to um, prevent EMT and also prevent metastasis through this effect. But should also be aware that the growth of metastasis at the distant site is dependent on MET, making the mesenchymal cell back to becoming epithelial. So that, in that context, TGF-beta inhibitor could also be not so good. So, so quite frankly, I, I think it will be difficult to use TGF-beta inhibitors to, to inhibit EMT. Probably inhibition of the other proteomeric pathways or local inhibition uh, to, to prevent the, the uh, effect on the immune system or on the uh, uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts or, or blood vessels would be more efficient. Uh, so I had a question. So uh, my question was, again, a bit more on the inhibition of receptor 1-induced EMT. So um, I wanted to understand a bit more on how localized uh, inhibitor therapy is. And if um, receptor 1 inhibition is more of a therapeutic treatment or a preventive measure that is taken against uh, tumors. I think it would be very dangerous to use these inhibitors for prevention because that could promote formation of tumors, particularly uh, colorectal cancer seem to be very much, uh, in that context, TGF beta has a very important suppressing effect. And if you then mutate uh, molecules along the TGF beta signaling pathway, you actually increase the risk of getting colorectal cancer. I think that would be very dangerous. The problem is that TGF beta has this dual effect. First, it suppresses in the early stages and then it promotes in the late stages. And if we are going to use inhibitors for treatment of patients, we really need to be very cautious not to remove also the suppressor effect. Uh, a follow-up to that. So um, how localized exactly is the inhibitor therapy? Because if it was not very localized to tumor sites, it would inhibit EMT across the body as well, which has plenty of negative effects as well, right? So how localized is the current th therapy? Right. EMT is important in wound healing. So that would be a potential side effect that you would um, perturb wound healing. But that would sort of be a, a problem. I, I'm not so sure because there is so many other molecules involved in, 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 in wound healing. So maybe it would not be so disastrous. But I think there are other problems with inhibiting EMT, as I just said. So, excuse me, sir. So thanks for the interesting presentation, sir. This question might be out of curiosity. That serine threonine kinase you mentioned about, no, sir, in the beginning of the lecture, and tyrosine kinase, serine threonine kinase, is that what's the specificity of choosing a single amino acids like lysine mutation and tyrosine uh, phosphorylation? Uh, would it lead to like side effects, sir, like adverse side effects? Can you say that again? Sir, the, what is the significance of choosing a single mutation, sir, like single amino acid mutation. In one of your slides, I have noticed like lysine have been mutated to arginine, I guess. Well, the, the type 2 receptor of TGF-beta is 
for serine 3 ionic kinase receptor. It phosphorylates uh, the type 1 receptor on serine 3 ionic kinase residues. But we, what we found it, that is that it, in addition, it can phosphorylate a tyrosine residue, a specific one, 182. And that leads to activation of SART. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure that I answered your question. Uh, so my question is, sir, what kind of amino acids we should target while uh, making it inhibit, to inhibit certain compounds, inhibit ah, and receptors? Okay. You mean which of the uh, tyrosine residues that are phosphorylated ah. by SART that we should inhibit? Yes. Sir. This is an excellent question, and this is exactly what we are now working on. But we don't have any data yet. Okay, so I'll follow up your research paper, sir. Thank sure, you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. you, thank you, Professor Heldon, for that exciting and insightful talk. It is amazing and daunting at the same time to hear the nuanced approach necessary to develop therapies in cancer. Yeah. Uh, again, once again, thank you, sir. I'm sure this. Yeah, please. I'm sure uh, this session will leave a lasting impact on all of us. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Vinod from the Go Global Engagement Office to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Santosh. It gives me great pleasure to offer my vote of thanks on this special occasion. Thank you, Professor Carl Hendrik Heldin for the insights on cancer and the activity of TGF-beta. It was really fascinating. And thank you for accepting our invitation to visit us at IIT Madras and Chennai. We have been humbled by your kindness and professionalism throughout our interactions. We are truly grateful to have you here today. We must also thank the IIT Madras leadership with special thanks to Professor Kamakoti Director IIT Madras for conceptualizing and fully supporting the lecture series. Professor Raghunathan Rekaswamy, Dean Office of Global Engagement, has been our guiding light. Our heartfelt gratitude goes to Professor Mahesh Panchadmula, Dean Alumni and Corporate Relations, for graciously accepting our invitation and delivering the opening remarks. We sincerely hope that the interaction of biotech department faculty with Professor Hilden have sown to seeds of curiosity and inquiry. We appreciate our faculty members' help and cooperation throughout this process. I also express my thanks to the staff of Global Engagement and Alumni and Corporate Relations for the support given in organizing this historical event. My sincere thanks to Professor Barun Sarkar from Mathematics for kind enough to spare this hall when we approached him. Finally, I would like to thank the audience for their insightful questions, and we would like to thank Professor Heldin again for his patience in answering all our questions. With this, we conclude today's session, and we invite you all to the professors, Professor Heldin's talk tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. at IITM Research Park. Thank you once again, and have a good day. Thank you.